love podcasts, hate nonsense. It's the Politics Duo podcast. How are we? I've got my coat on. <laughs> Not ready. <laughs> um, I'm going to call you out for two things. Oh. I Listeners should know I just offered Ava the chance to do the introduction. Because mm-hmm. I'm worried that sometimes people would critique Ollie and I for like hogging it and think it's like a sexist thing. Yeah. But you just don't want to say that you love podcasts and hate nonsense. Yeah, I know. Like a year in, you suddenly offer it to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true at all. <laughs> haven't been hogging it at all. <laughs> you, you have declined it before him. Do you know, when we did that live show in Liverpool and neither of you were there and it was just me. You got Ben Smoke to do it, didn't you? Ben Smoke and Mick Lynch. And I had to say love podcasts, hate nonsense in front of like a group of people looking at me. And I was like, like, do you know when you can feel the tears like welling up in your <laughs> eyes? And I was like. <laughs> Why do you object to it so much? No, because I, I was just like, this is so embarrassing. I was like, there's like all those oh, people, people looking love at you. It. They, and then you they go, love it. No, because that audience was like a. That was like that audience was a mix of people who liked politics, Joe. Oh, and just they're interested in seeing Mick Lynch. Yeah, it's not necessarily our our guys. And so, like the the one person I was like looking at in the front row, she was like seventy five odd, and I was thinking, what's she going to think of this? Like, because she, she, she clearly is a paedophile, and you don't want to alienate them. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> you, you, object, you object to the opinions of people who are pro paedophile. Do you have one of those things that Sasha Baron Cohen had during Made in America? Where <laughs> the video <pedo> detector. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, no, I do. Um, second thing. Mm. What time were we rolling? 12. What time did you start having lunch? 11.56. What time? <laughs> <laughs> Sick. <laughs> what? Cool, cool, cool. That's the thing. Is, oh, sorry. In the, open, in the interest of... to say? Yes. Go on, what is it? Timekeeping. Timekeeping? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, you and Ollie on that now, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, is, this, is the, this isn't rolling we're just having an HR review yeah 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 mm. I'm your boss now mm. um, do, you have any, do you have any notes from me? Uh, well look. <laughs> <laughs> um, shall we what, what should we talk about first? Well, I think we should talk about your, your favourite topic William Rag. yeah Willie Rag has resigned the whip he has after coward Sunak refused to take it from him <laughs> and after Jeremy Hunt called him brave he was so brave. Can, can you can you enlighten me, us, as to why this wasn't like a, the quickest whip removal of all time? Sunak was talking about that this morning and he was saying that um, some people will think I've made the wrong choice for it. And it's like, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then he didn't give any more detail. I um, th- Okay, wait, there's actually... When you look in hindsight because of how dramatically the story has changed, because also remember that when, on the Wednesday when this actually broke, we didn't know who it was and we genuinely thought it was a, a Chinese state intervention. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of days afterwards when we found out that it was William Rag, mm-hmm. but I guess we still thought it was Chinese state intervention. We don't know this, not, do we? Yeah, but... Okay, fine. But if a member of the Chinese state sends you a picture of their penis, you don't then have to send them numbers <laughs> of your colleagues and political journalists. No, you do. It's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's, it's polite. It's international diplomacy. So I thought this was this was quite good fun. So obviously Hunt praised it. And then uh, friends of RAG agreed that he was a victim in all of this. Victim actually being used. And Charles Walker told the BBC... He'd been the subject of a sting operation by a very clever and manipulative operator. (laughs) There's a lot of compassion out there. I'm not excusing what he's done, but I do think he is a victim in this along with all the others. I suppose what we don't have are the messages that William Rag received. Because all the ones that are from Abby and Charlie or whatever, that's after, well, William Rag was going to be passed on some of those numbers. So I would like to see what the sophisticated messages because they must have been bloody good to, for like to fall for that I think it's sad that someone got honey trapped like that mm-hmm. I think it's sad that someone was sent these unsolicited unsolicited messages and then responded to them mm-hmm. earnestly mm-hmm. like that is I feel I feel bad for mm-hmm. him but there was no reason for him then to, once he's identified that this is not a real person yep. or a person with malintent, he should not have just dropped all of his colleagues in. And sp- importantly, not notified 
the people whose numbers he'd given over to him that this was happening. Yeah, this is, it's, what's really funny is when, did you see Henry Zeffman on Newsnight talking about he got like the messages from like Abby or Charlie? Yeah. And it, reading about these messages and it's always like, and did you follow for it? He's like, no, obviously yeah. not. I, I thought, crit I reflected critically. I was aware of, he wrote, I think, I think it was in the Times piece. That would be Harry York. No, excuse me. It was in the BBC article then. He wrote about being like, my first thought was, which sounded incred incredibly pompous, what if this is a foreign state actor looking for secrets? <laughs> but like, if you work in parliament or whatever, you probably should have that level of scrutiny. Or yeah. That, of like awareness of your position. Yeah, I, if someone just out of the blue messages you and you are... Uh, claiming to have met you as well. Claiming to have met you and you're quite an important person. Mm, definitely. I think that you should... Because what else is happening? Are people just messaging them randomly being like, hey, just to let you know, um, if you... It could have been so much worse is what I mean. So like it could have been that he blackmailed legislation choices out of him or voting intentions out of him. Mm -hmm. And who's to say, judging on this performance, that he wouldn't have also succumbed <laughs> to that, you know? yeah. Yeah, numbers is probably like the least l numbers that people didn't fall for. I suppose is probably the least damaging. Well, do you know what the other thing that's actually been bugging me about this is that he resigned the Conservative whip, but he's still an MP, mm -hmm. so so as not to trigger a by election. So I think that's what Sunak. That's probably the considerations that were going on in Number Ten was that they didn't want to have another by election. Yeah, the majorities almost halved. Yeah, and I think, so it's probably been like, well, if we take the whip away from him, we know that he's already planned to stand down at the general election. Yeah. So then he might just go, right, never mind, I'll pack it all in. Um, and there's probably been a discussion with CCHQ, which is like, look, you can resign the whip. We're going to keep supporting you. Do not stand down from that seat. Do well, not trigger a by-election. Yeah, I wonder if it's like, don't trigger a by-election by because there's going to be an election in no, just because that there. wouldn't matter. That that would just get subsumed into the oh yes, was actually into the general. Yeah. But, um, Let's not waste our time. Um, but also, is that serving the MPs, <coughs> uh, the MPs, the con constituents of Hazel Grove particularly well that they've now got an independent MP sitting there? Who, by the way, we don't know. We'll see what happens when he next comes back to Parliament. But a few weeks ago, he was quite a desirable MP to have. You know, he was chair of the 1922 committee. He was chair, uh, he was sitting on a select committee mm -hmm. um, and he had the conservative whip. So like, you know, that's someone who is representing you in a number of different parts of the party. That's quite a senior conservative figure, right? Yep. It's a senior MP to mm -hmm. have representing your needs as a constituent. Now he's none of those things because he's resigned, mm -hmm. like none of them at all. And he probably won't want to turn up to the chamber to speak and or he, face his constituents. Well, if you're, after all of this furor, do you think that, he, apart from to vote, is he really going to go into Parliament and start doing interventions? <laughs> like, is he going to be like, Prime Minister, I have a question. <laughs> I have one. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> or if, would you trust him? Say you, like, quite, you have someone, you need help. Are you going to trust the guy who fell for this? Are you going to trust the guy who was thick enough to fall for this he and they pass on. He's like, I'm going to give, let me take your number. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. It's actually, a, uh, it's, it's a privacy and data nightmare. Mm. I would, ref I, you need to send him an order to delete, to delete all your information. Yeah. And see what he's passed on. There was probably a bit of, a, a real worry actually, when this story first started, you know, coming out properly or be, you know, the, the details are being revealed, that if you're someone who has sent sensitive information to William Ragg, you're probably thinking, oh my God, there's been Chinese state intervention mm -hmm. on William Ragg's phone. There's been a hack. They're going to have access now to loads of my details. Mm -hmm. There was probably a real earnest panic about that if you've sent him something compromising that like the Communist Party now has it. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Um, so the Tory majority is now down to 45, <laughs> is it? And Sick. I don't know. Would you be have believed that the another chunk of the Conservative majority has been, has been knocked off because uh, someone couldn't keep it in their pants? That's interesting because that means that only 23 people now have to vote against a Conservative policy for it not to pass. The 23, yes. Mm. Yeah. Good maths. That's slim, that, isn't it? Yeah, very slim. Um, I thought it'd be fun to come up with some ideas about what, try and predict what the next Tory scandal will be. Ooh, go on. I think 
what's going to happen is, do you remember that scam that was going around? I think it was happening quite regularly two or three years ago. You'd get a WhatsApp and it would be from like CEO of your company. And he'd be like, I need your help urgently. I need four grand of Microsoft points. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you'd be like, oh yes, of course. Because they, you, they'd usually target quite junior people who never maybe never interacted with the CEO before. So they'd go off down to Tesco and buy 4,000 pounds worth of Google points or Microsoft points or whatever, then send them on. There's going to be, it's going to be found out that quite a junior Tory MP has um, maybe 2019 intake has been doing has been pretending to be Rishi Sunak and instructing other MPs to to, to send them to Amazon buy them vouchers, yeah, <laughs> thousands of pounds <laughs> worth of gift cards, and like the threats are like, we will deselect you if you do not not do this. <laughs> and so there's like a, a a much older, maybe like nearing the father of the house. Yep, yep. <laughs> who's been <laughs> who's been what's it called? Loads of money has been taken from him. Um. Fraud, fraud. Yeah, what's that word? Stolen from? Extorted. Extorted. He said, <laughs> he said hundreds of thousands of pounds extorted Bill from Bill Cash him. is in poverty. <laughs> okay, I've got one. Mm. There'll be a change to... So do you know that they wanted to make it... Um, well, there, there was talk of making it criminal that you couldn't advertise on, like, spare room, that someone could... Like a, a young woman could live in your house for free, but they have to walk around naked the entire time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep. They have to get rid of that piece of legislation because an MP realises he's accidentally been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this scenario, an MP has a lodger mm. and instead of paying rent, they she, just have she, to walk she's around obliged naked. to walk around naked. And he's done this accidentally. Well, he doesn't realise that that's, that's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> but she was, she, she's not from the Chinese Communist Party. No, she's just, she's just She's from Iran. <laughs> I can have, why a man can't she's have a, a naked maid? She's a refugee. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought you wanted people to house people from Ukraine. <laughs> okay, this is woke gone mad. Yeah. Screaming about it. Okay, another, another Tory MP, mm -hmm. hypothetically. Yep. Has um, <laughs> gone down to the Dover coast to teach someone a lesson about crossing the channel. <laughs> and done the reverse. <laughs> They're now living in his house. <laughs> and he realises he's accidentally taken in a slave. Oh my God. You keep saying accidentally. <laughs> you're giving them like, a, in this hypothetical, you're giving them a lot of credit. So they have to rehaul all of the modern slavery act because they've been guilty they've well been if you were teach if you were just trying to make a political point then it's okay yeah yeah <laughs> i think one of them is going to be done for like cheating at Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> why are you so why are you so <laughs> <laughs> just different priorities isn't it okay um one of them might um don't know shoot someone that'd be good Sorry, be, I checked out for one second an and then I came back in. That would be an interesting scandal. Right. If, if a Tory MP shot someone. Okay. But, in, like, in, but in quite a grey area, not like murder. A, a grey area way. Like, who was it that shot... Was it like Reagan, Nixon maybe, shot someone when they were hunting? So, no, it's, it's Cheney, Dick Cheney. I thought, I thought hunting. you were going to go down the hunting route, yeah. And uh, he's, you were in my way! <laughs> <laughs> okay, um... A Tory MP takes out a load of constituents mm -hmm. um, to go fox hunting. Mm -hmm. When they turn up, he doesn't have enough horses. So he's like, well, you can just run alongside us. <laughs> and uh, You can be the fox. <laughs> yeah, he accidentally makes his constituent the fox. <laughs> oh, he accidentally introduces the, the greatest game, the hunt of man. Yeah. Bring back man hunting yeah. into Dorset. I think that'd be quite a good... It's good, though. I think we get people behind that. People should be able to consent to being the fox. Yeah. Good. I'm glad I've rounded that up. Have you got any more? I think I'm dry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm spent. Um, do you have any more? No. I mean, I could, but I think they'll get worse. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I, uh, I think they'll be, with all the, the news that's happened today, they'll be f furious. It could be like that pledge at the early, that near pledge at the early reform press conference where they accidentally really nearly reignited the troubles. <laughs> Remind me of that again. Where they were like, oh, we should send troops into Northern Ireland. 
<laughs> you, ac- you accidentally undo the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. <laughs> Tory MP. You invite, <laughs> you invite the IRA to Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Tory MP. You think it's be quite like a good like <laughs> cross community thing? Man sitting there Tor- armed. Tory MP sends nude to IRA man. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you're in the IRA, get in touch and tell us if a Tory MP has ever has ever sent you a picture of the dick. You know what was, you know what's funny to me is that I there are very few Tory MPs who understand what flag goes with what part of Ireland. Yeah, <laughs> it's so complicated, it's not. <laughs> I think it was Sunak or Sunak's press officer. Oh, what was that again? <laughs> they used the they used the. <laughs> Tricolor well, he way. was talking about Great Britain and the Windsor Framework, and it was like, what's that got to do with anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking morons. Um, Shall we do some, some news? Yeah, go on then. So the cash report came out today, and it says that children who uh, have been let down by lack of research and remarkably weak evidence on gender issues, it was a four-year study exploring gender identity services for under-18s, and it was announced by the NHS after there was a sharp rise in the number of people questioning their gender. So it concluded that there is no clear evidence on whether social transitioning has a positive or negative effect on mental health outcomes. It also su- it also suggested that 17 to 25 year olds go through follow through care until the age of 25. It also recommends, amongst other things, that clinicians treat patients' issues in a kind of holistic manner, so they don't just see them as um, you're here to be to, because of your gender issues. You're here. You also are autistic, depressed, etc. Trying trying to create the kind of sense of holistic care for trans for young trans people. So it actually it's 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 actually got a lot more questions than it has answers. It's not it's not um the way that it's been billed this morning in quite a lot of the media is that this is this landmark review that will put an end to children transitioning. And mm-hmm. actually that's not what Hilary Cass was saying in the report at all. <clears throat> I'm gonna say something and just try and try and find the nuance in this it's actually a quite it's actually a really interesting report Mm -hmm. because what she's talking about particularly what she's talking about when children can't access local services because local services are so frightened of the toxicity around the debate that they basically just go oh god we can't handle that child so i'm going to put them into um a gender identity clinic and then that means that they then go on a waiting list for four years and then eventually they might get puberty blockers. But what she's identified is that there's no services that are holistic. There's no holistic mm-hmm. approach to transitioning. So it means that if you're, if you're a child experiencing gender dysphoria, you, you don't get to go to therapy. And a lot of that is to do with the binary nature of the debate because it's so hard and fast in each camp that it means that... Um, Basically, local services are too frightened to intervene or get involved. Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating. It says so much about the state of, um, well, mental health in our country that you you cannot access um, therapy Mm -hmm. easily at all. You know, someone's experiencing gender dysphoria when they're 12 years old, even if they are the perfect candidate for puberty blockers and they should they should go on them. The idea that they would go on them without having their hand held oh, yeah, during crazy. that, yeah. to have no therapy during that seems totally nuts to me. I just think as well, like it's exposed the kind of, I'm not really saying this word, mess- messianic, yeah, the messianic mm-hmm. zeal of anti-trans campaigners because they've hijacked this report and said that it, this is, it's vindicated them. This is exactly what the feminists have been talking about for years. You know, some people are so intolerant of the alternate point of view that young children might need to access services. And I'm not saying they immediately have to access puberty blockers, even though in some cases they might, but they might actually have to access therapy. That They're just so blind yeah. to, <coughs> um, to the needs of these children. Mm, it's, it's so unhelpful. Yeah, and I think the holistic approach Cass recommends is definitely to be welcome because obviously that's being being trans is pretty tough pretty tough deal mm. to have to deal with a parent of a trans child said to the guardian guardian do we really come across as the kind of parents who are absolutely delighted to have a transgender child we might be the kind of parents who'd be absolutely willing to support our transgender child but in an ideal world i would much rather my child was growing up in a way 
in which she wasn't sticking out like a sore thumb and potentially going to end up dead. Mm. Which I think is like, what I think a lot of the discussion about this seems to be is when people talk about trans people, people talk about as if there's some sort of weird conspiracy to like make kids trans, which doesn't exist, like fully doesn't exist. And I think that the, the so maybe perhaps some of the dangers of this report, not dangers, unintended consequences, perhaps might be like talking about the introduction of uh, the follow through service for some between the ages of 17 to 25 and people not starting treatment till the age of 25. I think it's really quite, well, what, what can you do? Imagine all the things you can do when you turn 18. Yeah. That you, like, you can drink, vote, join the army, etc. But the idea you can't, I don't know, express your gender correctly is pretty well, that Well, that's because she was, in the report, she's talking about how there's not enough evidence to say that so socialisation is helpful for someone experiencing gender dysphoria. So she's basically saying that there's, like, there's no, just because you've allowed, allowed, gosh, a child has changed their name mm -hmm. or is identifying as a, another gender. Mm -hmm. There's not enough evidence to, to substantiate whether that is beneficial um, and it's probably because the pool of reference is so small. You know, this this is a topic that has engulfed the country. We talk about it all the time. Yeah. And when you actually look at the numbers, like if you were to put them as a dot on the map, you would not see that dot. It would be like, where's, where's Wally? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also maybe important to note with this report is they rejected a lot of studies out of hand. Mm. I couldn't, like a, t a ton of it, they just rejected for not being high quality enough. Which I, I couldn't really, I didn't really seem to be able to stand, understand the rationale behind that. Because there's so few, I mean, so do you see the graph that showed like from uh, 20, oh, I think it was 2010-ish, mm. the rise in the number of children who are looking for, um, looking for help with gender mm. dysphoria has significantly increased. And she pointed towards like, well, it might be social media, but like couldn't conclude whether that was because they weren't documenting the children enough back then or whether that was because children didn't know that that was the dysphoria they were experiencing. Mm. They didn't understand how to put it into words and they might do now. But then is that, but there must have been studies done about that before. And Cass basically says we're rejecting all previous hundreds of studies mm. that have been done because they're not high quality enough. And also on that point, I think, why is there more trans people or pe gender questioning people now, it's maybe because the same reason there's more left-handed people now than there was 100 years ago. People have trying, stopped trying to suppress it. Yeah, you stop burning them at the stake. <laughs> yeah, um, people, people, like if, if you, it's like representation, isn't it? Like once you realise that, oh, this is actually something that I can, no, totally, can be and that's why I think social media has been really helpful mm. for people because it sort of, it allows you, it, it's sort of like, you know, when everyone gets really angry about this, uptick in the number of people who have ADHD or who have autism or you know you basically just realize that they're on the spectrum mm -hmm. and people get really angry about it and it's like why social media has been great in like allowing people to understand that some of their behaviors that they didn't understand are linked to something and so that they can it just makes you you feel better you can socialize yourself better mm -hmm. when you're aware of why you're acting in a certain way mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. otherwise, a lot, you know, you, you're, you're there going, well, why am I so different? Why are all of them allowed to like, I don't know, be in this really crowd, tight space, loud area? Mm -hmm. And that makes me panic, have a panic attack. Why is that happening to me? And then you might get diagnosed with autism and you go, oh. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. yeah. What you were talking about before um, about... Um, there's this idea that we're trying to make everyone trans. Um, that's the fear. And I think that that's probably to do with the sort of breakdown of gender norms that's been going on or been happening for the past 20 years where, you know, on a very basic level where you're like, oh, girls like pink and boys mm. like blue. And now actually, you know, it's quite fashionable <coughs> to dress your children in either color, uh -huh. no matter of their gender. And that's like the really soft, fluffy, basic end of it. And I think that some, then you get like, you know, up until probably they're about 10 or 11, children of all genders play on the same sports teams in a lot of schools. Mm -hmm. And that gets conflated into, instead of going, oh, girls and boys actually 
can interact in the same spaces in a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the time and they don't need to be separated. Mm -hmm. That sort of gets conflated by the right wing media into everyone is going to be trans, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, it's become like a spectre that means all things, it can mean all things to all people. I think something to be said as well about the current state of trans healthcare in that people seem to think that you present at a gender clinic say, I think I'm trans, next thing you're having gender-affirming surgery and be given estrogen yeah. to transition. No, that's not, that's not remotely the case. The waiting lists to, like, for, for medical transition are years and years and years and years. And people, and it's linked to a lot of trans suicides, is that they've been on a waiting list for so long, they felt that they haven't um, been able to, they felt that they're not being listened to, they're not, and they're not going to be able to ever get into this thing because gender dysphoria is really pretty horrible. Imagine feeling like that. Be it's, it's something. It's like we talk about it a lot, but it's something that the vast majority of us will never ever experience. Yeah. Like we're incredibly fortunate to feel comfortable in the bodies that we are born in, and to be identified with the genders that we were assigned at birth. And so I think there's just a stunning lack of empathy in the. It's like the. Oh, you are. Oh, you feel this way. Oh, you are oh, you 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 are wrong for feeling it that way. Oh, you're a freak. Oh, mm -hmm. you are this. Especially considering the rate, I, I really don't think the idea that someone would volunteer to take on this life exists. Like considering the rates of violence against like trans women yeah. in particular and suicide rates amongst tra trans people and like the stigma. Imagine being like, <laughs> imagine volunteering to have Julia Hartley Brewer talk about you every single day. I think I think it's. it's well, the Crazy. human the human element has been has been lost because of the right wing hysteria over mm. it, and actually, well, there's a lot of left wing hysteria on it as well. But um, but yeah, the hysteria you've through that you've lost out the person. I also just think that we're giving up a lot of ground uh, for you know a lot of ground that decides what is right and fair yep. for trans people and how they should be accommodated or how we can accommodate them because we're you know on account of one or two criminals so like what we've basically done is gone well okay so self-identification it takes years and it has to be signed off by a doctor mm. um da -da -da. we need to be wary of that because there might be one weirdo <laughs> who uses this system yeah. so that he can go into a girl's changing room and wank himself silly yeah and it's like you're compromising all of these people for a criminal mm -hmm. like that would be as nuts as saying like we okay we need to put this is a very different example we need to put all of the lurpak behind <laughs> um an iron security rail uh -huh. because there's one person who might steal it like it doesn't that i just think that huge compromise that we're doing as a society is actually like it's almost an indictment of our ability to identify mm -hmm. a wrongen yes you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Like, it's quite clear if someone is going through the self-ID process because they would like to identify as another gender because that's how they feel that they are, mm. compared to, say, someone who's like... An opportunistic criminal. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I just uh, <laughs> wouldn't mind going there, Mother Lou's. They're a lot cleaner, aren't they? <laughs> you know, it's just so obvious. Yeah, it's, like, it's like in, like, those old films, like, they don't, you know, like, I, I, it, can't, you can't, it can't happen anymore because of woke. Yeah, but like when men would pretend to be gay in films and just do like the most like broad caricature, like the character was like they need to pretend to be gay to get a promotion or something like that, and they wouldn't get the details right. Yes, and it would be like the most ridiculous caricature. Yeah, the most it would, yeah. like over exaggeration. Something, something I think is missing from the discourse, which I think people should do, is just like I kind of touched on it there, but just like just I'd like some more empathy in the debate for trans kids. Especially. Out of me. Out of you, especially. Mm. You say some horrific things yeah. on camera. <laughs> don't say that. No, obviously she doesn't. She doesn't. No, she I doesn't. don't. She doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't. Not about <clears> trans <throat> people, other people. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there should be more, yeah, just empathy. I think it'd be like, this would be quite a scary day for trans people, for people like, if you've got a trans child, I think yeah. that's, that's, like their life is probably going to become, if these, if these recommendations are implemented, a lot of them would probably make their life a fair bit harder.
Well, to have your body politicised yeah. pretty much every day. You know, Wes Streeting came out with a very quick statement in response to the CAS report, and he was talking about, like, yeah, absolutely, we would implement all of these measures. And I was reading that, and I was thinking, I'm going to make a note of that, because that means that you're going to now implement mental health hubs. That means that you're going mm. to improve the spending on therapy that's going to be in, you know, available to anyone who needs it. Because it's not just about... It, this is actually pointed out in the report. It's not just about the gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. It's about how there just is a total lack of mental health services. Yep. So it means that it, you, even if you don't know what you're experiencing, you don't get the opportunity to go and talk it through. Mm -hmm. Like if you're extremely depressed, you don't, you know, you get put on a drug rather than getting to, you know, going to discover why you might be really depressed. You might be depressed because. I don't know, you've got an underlying, uh, you, you've got PTSD, but you don't know about it. Yep. That's not going to be helped by just, by not talking about it and being fed drugs in the same way that being given puberty blockers without any therapy is not going to lead to a healthy transition. Mm -hmm. There's also, they talked, a fair bit of the report is talks about people who de-transition, which is interesting yeah. because that's like such a tiny minority of trans people. Yeah. And it is like, if you've gone through this process and you, regret it yeah fucking horrific fair enough you should be supported but centering your approach to this around the worst case scenario which happens like so fewer than people who have like healthy adults and like it's really like well ban lip fillers thing. ban botox ban ban anything that could be yeah, a, a yeah that yeah like, like the phrase the phrase is life altering isn't it yeah that's, that's ban tattoos it. yeah that's the point I think about like between people are talking about well what are all the life altering things you can do before the age of 25 like you can get married you can have a baby you can get a tattoo you, you could, could join the army you, you can't reverse army. that decision can you you can um, move you can move to a different country and so what so why are people able to do that when they turn 18 yeah it's the policing of your body because it's 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 actually it's it's so nanny state actually, which is quite interesting because you think that, that actually this government is very nanny state. Yeah. It's a very evangelical government, mm -hmm. um, and you know there it, actually no no part of their policy has been laissez faire for like years. Mm -hmm. It's all been like even the smoking ban. That, <laughs> no, but seriously, back to, yeah, yeah. Back to me. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> no, but ser ser seriously, that's that's a real intrusion into your privacy. Being told that this is. We've decided we don't want you to do something, mm -hmm. and so we're going to make it illegal for you to do it. Yeah, that's that's not conservative in any sense of the word. Like to, to be told, like you should be allowed to go and take puberty blockers. If okay, oh, okay, you should be allowed to go and take. Uh, yeah, you should have gender reaffirming su surgery if you want to, and then if you later down the line decide that you didn't want that, then that's your cross to bear. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not the government's job to be telling you who, what, where, when, how. Yeah. Uh, or no, at no, least if they want to tell you what to do with your body, at least provide a service where they go, right, well, okay, we're not going to let you do that for two years, hypothetically. Mm. I know that the timeline is much longer than that. You need to go to therapy every single week for two years. And if you still feel the same way at the end of the two years, then a doctor will sign it off. Mm. And until you provide that provision, you shouldn't be at the table having the conversation. Yeah, I think there's also maybe a danger in that as well, <clears> though, because you need to like maybe pr um, police the people giving the therapy, because like you said, like they might they might just don't know bring in conversion therapists in a, in like a the NHS. oh yeah for sure the, the NHS is under pressure they might outsource it he's to con conversion therapy he's got rid of that conversion therapy band. I know what the fuck is that about that's I'm telling you it's a very evangelical government I think we'll look back on this especially like, I think in GCSEs in like 20 years time they'll be like well with the rise of the National Conservative Conference <laughs> <laughs> Miriam Cates dictates the policy Osama Bin Laden did New Labour Miriam Cates did um, does conservative policy yeah who's worse who's worse Osama Bin Laden or Miriam Cates I'm not going to answer that I think it's a really obvious answer oh <laughs> <laughs> Miriam Kate. <laughs> you thought I was trying to get you. Yeah, and I got myself. Yeah. I mean, who could possibly compare? <laughs> I don't like comparing the crimes. 
Yeah. And but speaking of the, you know, the sort of rise in conservatism, there mm. is, well, there's actually been quite a lot of chatter about banning abortion or sorry, pulling back on abortion legislation. Right now it's up to 24 weeks in the UK. Mm -hmm. And there's been quite a lot of chat from actually conservative MPs that that sh number should be, those weeks should be reduced. Um, and Stella Creasy, who is the Labour MP for Walthamstow, will be coming in. I'm going to speak to her in a minute about um, what she wants to do, which is decriminalise abortion. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, let's hear from Stella. It always feels like when we have a discussion around abortion. I think that the two extremes sort of take Thanks. over the, the, the grey area, the sensible grey area that is in the middle because what you're saying is entirely rational but it has the ability to be misconstrued or misinterpreted. And one person who did that, you mentioned earlier, was uh, Conservative MP Neil O'Brien. Yes. Um, who's a senior, um, senior MP. And he said that Stella is arguing for people to be able to kill a baby the day before it's due to be born and face no consequences. This is an incredibly extreme and bad proposal. Is that what you're advocating for? No, absolutely not. And Neil hasn't seen the words of the amendment that we as a group, and it's a cross-party group, so this is not a party political issue, um, have tabled because it's a quirk that right now Parliament isn't sitting. So the amendment doesn't appear on the order paper for him to even have seen for him to say such things. But what his words do speak to is a ratcheting up of the debate and discussion around abortion in this country in the way that we have seen in America. And I would appeal and urge anybody who considers themselves to be pro-choice not to be complacent that what has happened in America with the attacks on a woman's right to choose would never happen here in England and Wales because they do not realise how access to abortion is under a sustained and persistent attack. That is one of the reasons why we want to bring in this Northern Ireland lock as well, to prevent those attacks from happening behind closed doors. Because what is driving this increase in prosecution of women for having an abortion in of itself isn't entirely clear. It hasn't come from anything democratic or anything through Parliament. It's come from possibly the NHS or people within the police who don't uh, support a woman's right to choose. I would appeal to Neil to perhaps look at the words before he speaks and understand actually what this amendment will do and how it retains the integrity of the 24-week limit. And that would guide what services were provided, I say, with the caveat that where there were cases post-24 weeks, that would be covered by the current medical exemptions that we already have. Um, and also to recognise that if you consider yourself to be um, pro-life, you know, restricting access to abortion, using this kind of inflammatory language doesn't stop abortions. It just stops safe abortions. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen time and time again, and we're now seeing in America, is the consequences of when you restrict access to a safe uh, and legal service. And the consequences are that women die. And the same thing with Hungary. But um, there are actually quite a few pro-life conservative MPs. I think What's interesting is when, when the topic comes up in Parliament, the number of MPs that are willing to stand up and say that they don't agree with abortion. So you're right to say that it is, we are sort of teetering on the edge of it not being taken away. But there is a danger there that we could, we, we could well, I won't be hyperbolic, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, let me then, as somebody who has lived this debate for several years and been subjected to campaigning and targeted attacks by some of these people, and I say that as somebody who has also sat down with people who are passionately against abortion, whether in my own community or nationally, and had perfectly decent and reasonable debates. But the um, inflammatory language and the incentive, I've had these people in my community telling people that I want to kill babies and put them in bins, um, harassing my local community, putting leaflets through everybody's doors um, with graphic imagery on in my local area. Um, this is an American style tactic that we have had imported into, the, into this country that we didn't have when we last did work on abortion reform. Um, and we've seen it in the NHS. We've seen a growing level of anti-choice activism. And it is anti-choice. It's not pro-life because, as I say, you put women's lives at risk when you restrict access to abortion. Um, that is not to say that these people should guide what we do in terms of service provision and that we shouldn't try to make progress and learn from other countries that have decriminalised abortion and what that's done to women's health there. But it is to recognise that there will be a backlash. So you need to get ahead of that backlash if you actually want to achieve the goal that we want, which is to have a safe and legal and hopefully local service for women, that if they make that choice, they are able to make it in dignity and in privacy. Do you think the Conservative Party has become more evangelical since Rishi Sunak took over? 
I think there has definitely been organisation um, on a practical level. We've seen organisations like Right to Life recruiting lots and lots of staff. That requires a lot of money. Uh, we see much more activism within Parliament from the um, anti-choice movement. It cuts across Parliament. I want to be very open and honest. This is not a party political issue. I know there are people on my own side who disagree on a woman's right to choose. I think the point I'm making is that it has become a much more contested issue than perhaps those who consider themselves pro-choice would recognise. And I would be extremely wary of not being able to overcome that because at the end of the day, what we all want to do is make sure that women can access a, a safe service. And when you know that, I mean, next year, we're, we're going to have the National Conservative, actually, maybe later this year, National Conservative Conference, and, you know, Suella Ravan is going to be speaking on the same stage as Victor Orban. When you hear things like that, you know, serving Conservative MPs, standing alongside extremely, uh, well, Conservative in the actual, you know, in the, the sense of the word, figures, does that worry you about, you know, where women's rights could go in the UK? Well, we've seen that women's rights and women's bodies are the battlefield of the far right culture wars. We've seen it not just in America, but in Europe. I sit here, I'm the chair of the Labour movement for Europe, and I'm also talking to my colleagues in different countries around Europe. You know, people might be worried that Trump might win the American presidency, but they're not looking at Orban, they're not looking at Georgia Maloney, they're not looking at Gert Wilders, um, the rise of the AFD, uh, Marine Le Pen in France. There is growing organisation of a far right um, political agenda that uses what you might term equalities issues as its gateway drug to power. Uh, and women's bodies and women's rights have been at the forefront of that. The powerful story is Poland, where Poland, where it was women who organised and resisted, and they did so on the basis of pr defending their rights to choose what happens to their own bodies. And that's what led to the success of Donald Tusk. And I think there's a real concern for many of us that we are sleepwalking into having those debates here in England or not even recognising the role that the UK could play in partnership with our colleagues in Europe in standing up for progressive values because we think it's on the extremes, it's on the fringes. It's in the heart of the UK Parliament already. Um, it's very much in the debates that are happening at a grassroots level. Um, this is a good example of where as you saw in that tweet, the extremes are starting out with the conversation. The reality is a much more thoughtful, measured proposal that is seeking to balance people's concerns about time limits, concerns about regulation and concerns about a woman's dignity and, and, and equality. I hope that's the debate we can have in Parliament. I fear in the coming days as we get to this, it'll be the heat, not the light that people will see coming forward. I just urge people not to be uh, complacent that somehow people aren't responding to that or reacting to that because actually whether it is on women's rights whether it is on how we treat trans people whether it is on how we uh, respond even to refugees these battles are being organized and fed by that international rhetoric but they are very much having a consequence in our homes and final word read the amendment <laughs> it's an old-fashioned <laughs> uh, you know obviously that's what makes me uh you know fit all the kind of bugbears as somebody who campaigns to work with our European partners who supports women's rights old-fashioned idea maybe read what's on the paper first before deciding you don't like it mm. yes yeah, so that was Stella Christie speaking to Ava have you got anything else to add before we wrap this up what would I add? I haven't done the interview yet. <laughs> Anything in particular? Let's leave that they don't that. know. They don't know that. That's going to be the magic of editing. Yes. So that's, isn't that weird? Stella's about to be interviewed in about seven minutes, mm. and you guys have just watched it. Yeah. God. God. Time. Really, Rending really. space. And you're and, time. and you're watching this in about seven hours. Yeah. I'm going to be in Cumbria then. Really. Yeah. <laughs> nice. What, come. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you saying nice at come? <laughs> no. Brie. Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> cheese. Imagine you were like that. Imagine you were like a mmm, <laughs> yummy. It's like when cat people like. Yeah. I like, it's fine if you like cats. You, no, say it with your chest, what you're about to say. You it know, is you, fine if you like cats. No, no, no. I want no caveats. Give your full opinion on cat people. <laughs> you know, when they're like posting like, Stella's here. <laughs> cat. <laughs> no, say your cat people thing. Say it. <laughs> Okay, so if it's a way to get Stella, I'll tell you her real opinion about cats. <coughs> it is my opinion about cats. Some cats are really fucking ugly and disgusting. Two of the last cats I interacted with were the most minging animals I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I'm a dog person. Ava's, Ava hates animals. Ava's going to post something anti-trans on the Instagram. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, Ava's away to go and speak to Stella. Um, I'm going to Cumbria. Hope you all have a lovely evening and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>